I'm Mejisa, um, birth name Sandra Jo Holiday, and I've done work, artwork all my life. I saw a picture of a, a sister in the Essence magazine, and um, I, her eyes just spoke to me. Um, they say eyes are the mirror of the soul, but um, I, since the COVID, I've been forced to look at people's eyes. And I'd say within the first few seconds, it can tell you everything about that person. Um, sometimes they'll look away. Sometimes they'll look down. Sometimes you can tell that they're smiling because their eyebrows go up. Um, and uh, the eyes are just powerful. And I love drawing eyes. Life is art and art is life, is what my father used to say. And so I elaborate on that a little bit and say that the mind is a canvas, impressed, written on, painted, splashed, uh, with mixed media, based on our truths and how we interpret the world. Just, uh, I wanted to to celebrate black men and black women and the rise of the consciousness. Back in the 90s, I was doing a lot of reading from black scholars like Diab and uh, Clark and um, Browder and, um, just, and just so full. And I wanted to celebrate and I, and I had to work with what I had. And I want to emphasize that to artists too, you know, it's not all about going out and buying a bunch of stuff, it's working with what you had. And I had some blue jeans, uh, and I had scraps of fabric, and I had something to say. So I brought all that together to make the statement and celebration of us. Yeah. Uh, my father, he painted work, uh, works uh, that depicted African people, and really people from all over the world. We grew up looking at people from Japan and um, Greece and um, just uh, all from all over, but especially African and African American people. So we grew up looking at these images and some were on the wall so long, they became my friends. <laughs> and when I would come home from school and the picture would be gone because it was sold, my heart would, I would, I would be upset. It's like, Daddy, where's, where's that picture? I sold it, you know. You sold it? <laughs> it's like my friend. But I, I loved looking at those images, images of these brown tone, full lips, broad nose, high cheekbones, kinky, curly, curly hair, and those brown eyes, and their magnificence, and head wraps, and earrings, and nose piers, and tattoos, and, and I'm looking at these people, and, and, and some of them look like me, and it filled me with a sense of, of pride. And so I'm, I'm so thankful for, the, for that. Now, I didn't realize that you know, you're, you know, you're a child, you assume that everybody is growing up with this. And so, you know, back in the day, you weren't allowed to go over people's house. But when you did, you know, you're fucking around. And I kept, as I would venture into homes, I kept looking for pictures that looked like us. I thought everybody had pictures that looked like us. Back in the day, it was just pictures of matadors that was close to color flowers, um, and maybe uh, John F. Kennedy, and um, pictures of Jesus and white angels. That was it. And so that, you know, that made an impact on me, you know. So art is, uh, is so important, uh, the way it affects your psyche and how you feel about yourself. And I'm really grateful to my father for sharing his gift 
um, lifting people up. Talk about your father, Mr. Joe Holliday. Joe's, Joe's Holliday. So tell me a little bit about uh, how you got started painting. It was any any of his paintings something that inspired you? Tell me a little bit about that. I, I just love to draw. So my father always provided us with crayons and uh, paper. And uh, sometimes I think just to keep us quiet. <laughs> <laughs> but it worked because I would lose myself in uh, the movement of the crayon. I can still feel um, how the crayon went across the paper over the hardwood floor. And um, um, the sensation of it and, and then the admiration we'd get, you know, uh, about the drawing. And my father, he would always... Uh, now that I look back, he probably was just pretending to be real serious <laughs> about it. It's like, I want to explain this, you know. It was, okay, well, this is that and that, and, you know, and he would, you know, listen and nod. And, and uh, I remember looking at his face, you know, to see if, you know, approval. And we were encouraged, and that's how I got started. And then I started doodling on everything. I can remember in high school drawing on my pants in home in the homeroom. But the the irony of my father, I, my relationship is that he did not want me to be an artist, and so we struggled. Um, uh, he wanted to. I didn't learn until maybe two years before he died. Uh, I understood why we clashed because he didn't want me to go that way. He didn't want me to go through what he went through. I can remember my father coming home um, um, being so angry or upset because he would go to put his work in different exhibits and he was rejected. And he knew that in spite of the quality of his work, his subject matter, especially if it was African or African-American, was not going to be accepted. But you can't dampen a, the spirit or your, your soul's purpose. If you're supposed to be an artist, you're gonna be one uh, regardless. And so we, before he passed, we had that understanding. And uh, I hadn't been painting on the level that I am now, but he encouraged me. And, um, and that was uh, our bonding and, and, and peace for me. I started off doing realism because I like drawing faces and eyes, but I think that was because of the influence of my father. But being the daughter of a person that's very famous is hard. Um, you've always, you're always challenged. People will come up to you, well, oh, you, you're Joe Holliday's daughter. Uh, so what's your work like? Do you do work on his level? Or do you do work like him? And, and um, I would become intimidated by that. But then I learned, I remember that my father being the kind of man he was, he wouldn't have wanted me to do work like his. He would have told me, you know, um, why aren't you doing your thing? My apartment used to have all his work in there. If he had lived and saw that, he would have said, Sandra Joe, why is your work not on the wall? Yeah. So I would encourage people you know, to do your thing, do what you do, find your passion. So you can do realism, you can do abstract, you can do uh, surrealism. Um, do it all, experiment, and find your passion. I was a tomboy. I did not like purses. I mean, remember my oldest sister trying to get me to wear a purse. I carried my ID in my blue jean pocket and uh, because it was all about comfort to me. So I didn't like bags. Well, as I got older, I had to start wearing bags for different reasons. But then I couldn't find the kind of bag that I liked. The bags were stiff, kind of, you know, they just, they weren't my style. So I wanted something that was functional and kind of funky and it reflected me. And so I started making bags. Now, this kind of bag, it's, it's more elaborate. It's more of a piece of art. Um, but it always incorpor 
incorporates dinner because that is a, an American, even though uh, the Italians started making denim first, it has become an American icon. That's what we wear. We love denim. So I like, I like denim, and so I began to make purses out of denim. And because it was practical, I could wash the purse and wear it over and over again. As a matter of fact, Tony, could I see that purse that you're holding for me? Thank you. Um, this mm -hmm. is also one of the bags I've made. This bag is uh, 17 years old and it's still going um, that old. And these are the kind of bags I, I like to make because they're, you know, they're just, they're practical, easy to work with. This is more of an art piece. And um, um, I've incorporated mixed media, probably an influence of, uh, of Tony, because he takes different pieces and things and puts them together. So I incorporated jewelry and ribbon and, and pieces of fabric um, to make that design. I don't, I don't just draw for pleasure, even though I know for me, if I didn't do my work, I would be cray cray, <laughs> like real crazy. <laughs> and my mind is, is the, Art is a, a healing, it's like therapy for me. And so when I do it, I'm sharing the lessons and things that, that I've gone through. So I, my hope is when someone walks away from a piece that I've done, that they are either informed, enlightened, or inspired, or encouraged in some kind of way. What motivates you to start a piece and, and why, why, does it, why did it, or how did it motivate you? Uh, well, sometimes I see things in my head, like I'll have a, a vision of a picture. It can be inspired by a conversation, or um, part of a piece of art that I've seen, um, something I didn't get to say in a conversation. Uh, it, I'm stimulated that way. And if I don't get it out, it drives me crazy. Say, so I, gotta, I gotta get this out. It's like, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. Now, this piece is called A Woman Thought. And uh, I like this piece because it was a challenge for me because I don't like painting on canvas. So I had to, I had to uh, it took me on a journey of, uh, you know, coming, becoming familiar and accepting of the canvas. But I wanted to do something about women. And we're depicted a certain way, it's usually, you know, very feminine. And I decided to add the black power sign because women are behind every movement. Uh, anything that has a, a journey that is going forward, women are there. Um, we are the first house of a human spirit. And um, we're sacred, we're beautiful, we're strong, we're intelligent, we're nurturing, we're loving. And so I wanted to, but we're also powerful. We are never not powerful. And so that's why that fist is there. The, the femininity is there, um, the layers, uh, showing our complexity and the fist showing how powerful we are. These little girls um, symbolize the importance of being self. And I started making these little girls because, you know, in our society, little black girls are adulterated. We, they are not seen as children and not treated as children. And, and, and it affects how they feel about themselves. So I, um, I wanted to make these little, these little girls to remind little girls that they're beautiful and they're strong and they're worthy and they are valued. And so that's how it started out and that's why it started out. Now, the original signs were I love me 
because I am and emphasizing self-love. So that's how they got started. And then we started having the protests. So I added more signs of uh, uh, Black Lives Matter, stop the violence, go vote, um, peace, love, and power. Uh, our children are exposed to so much more now through technology, you know, the media, and they're so much more knowledgeable. So this, these little characters reflect that, where, where they are, where they're going, and all that's important about their being. Another thing my father used to always say, um, God is an artist. God's not a businessman. God's not, you know, he had his list and he would say, God is an artist, look around you. How have you evolved as an artist? I think I take more risk now than I did before. Um, but I had to I had to, to grow as a person in order for my work to get better. Sometimes we do what is familiar and not what we really feel. We put ourselves in boxes. Um, we get chained by other people's expectations. Uh, I wanted to do realism when really abstract was in my heart. Um, and it took me a while to get away from that and to feel confident enough in myself to say, hey, just do what you want. Do it how you want it. Don't worry about what people think. But before you can get beyond what people think, you gotta know how you feel about yourself and why. Yeah, so I went through I went through that and so now I'm more comfortable, you know, with what I do. Yeah, I don't care. My mindset is not, well, what will they think? My mindset is I will make them think. Talk a little bit about your last exhibit. The two pieces, no, three pieces, they were new. Um, they were on wood with um, tissue paper and um, and and glue. And I had seen those images in my head over and over again. And the images came from what was going on, the Black Lives Matter movement and this shift in energy that I was seeing and the young people standing up and speaking out, um, not just emotionally, but getting involved politically, uh, doing their research, knowing their politicians, um, uh, finding ways to position themselves to not just make a change, but to keep the change going, which was, a th I think, a little bit different from the civil rights movement. We got comfortable, but those pieces depicted that in the process, we do get tired and we do, we must take a look at ourselves. One of the pieces was on foot or not. And the, the person is holding the sign, but they're sitting down and their head is down because they're tired, but they're still holding that sign because they are not giving up. And I wanted to portray, um, I, I didn't want the protester in a stance that's very familiar, just standing and holding. I wanted to portray that protesters get tired. And I'm, I'm, so young, I'm so proud of our young people out there in the street, whether they're painting murals or teaching or sharing or uh, marching. But it doesn't mean that they don't get tired. We all get tired. And so I wanted to portray that this protester is tired. Tired, but not giving up. Resting, but not um, so tired that they're, they're, they're giving up. They're, they're resting, they're about to get back up. And so I wanted to depict that. And the mask shows the sign of the times. They're protesting, and even having to wear a mask, they haven't given up. 
even having to sit down, they're not giving up, and that sign is still up. Um, the other piece of, that I remember was called Stop the Violence. And um, it's been a frustrating journey, uh, what we've been going through in our community. Uh, people killing and hurting one another. And we have been under scrutiny from people who don't understand our history and why this is happening. Personally, I feel that um, when you lack self-knowledge and self-love, that it's easy for you to hurt someone who looks like you. And we're under a lot of pressure, uh, being oppressed, um, being denied jobs, being discriminated against, my, uh, uh, microaggressives, uh, and, and blunt, blatant um, uh, racism. And we're enduring this every day. And to think that it doesn't have an impact on our psyche, how we feel about ourselves is ludicrous. It does. In, in, on, in, in every aspect of our life. So um, that's where the violence comes from. And I believe personally that if we begin to embrace and know our history and our culture and value it and, 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 and implicate it, uh, I mean share it and, and apply it to our lives, our communities are gonna change. So this, this, this protester is protesting against the violence, walking away tired, but not giving up. And faces in here show who, the, who they're uh, protesting about, the people that they've lost and that they're not giving up. In order to, to move forward, we gotta take care of home first. We gotta, we gotta take care of where we live. We gotta clean up our communities. Um, and to do that, we need to understand why the violence is there, where it stems from. We need to know about um, uh, the impact on the psyche um, when it comes to slavery or the Jim Crow era, or just being discriminated on a regular basis in all um, ways. And when we start asking ourselves where our wounds root from, we can begin the process of healing. And knowing that, you know, when you look at your brother or your sister and they might be angry, it may have nothing to do with you. Can't take it personal, you know? Gotta, gotta think about where that's coming from. And instead of becoming uh, responsive, be proactive and make a decision to keep things calm down, to communicate, to get past that pain and say, what's really, what's really hurting you? What's the real deal? You know, instead of just going to get that, you know, and doing that bang, bang thing. Or, or fighting as some, you know, some sisters do, so. Where do you see, uh, or how do you see uh, the evolution of black art in Indiana from the past up until now? From what I can see, people, um, the younger people, the newer generation is more expressive. I think because of the level of racism that we were dealing with in the 50s and 60s, um, the level of discrimination um, caused artists to tend to be more traditional in order to be accepted, you know? Now I see uh, people finding and creating their own avenues to exhibit their work and to get it out there using the media, which we didn't have before, and, and not having to feel like they have to paint certain things in order to be accepted by certain people. So now I think the younger generation, they, they, they have more freedom to do that. And so the work has changed. They're taking more risk, you know, more mixed media, more abstract, more um, political views with their work. And so that's how I see that the work has evolved. 
So the murals, the Black Lives Matter murals in downtown Indianapolis. And as we see, we see murals throughout. Black Lives Matter is, is almost global in terms of murals. Um, how do you think those murals, or how do you feel those murals are expressing uh, themselves to others? When I see them, I, I have a sense of pride. The same, same kind of pride that I, in looking at my father's work. They're reflecting, uh, I know I keep referring back to my father, but he's, he said that an artist, a real artist is about the truth. And when I see those murals, it's about our reality, about what we're going through, about what is now. And, um, and that makes me proud. So, yeah. And I, and I can only imagine what it does for children, you know, seeing, seeing their images in action, um, hopefully inspiring them to do some research, um, to read, to want to know, to question, and challenge what's going on around them. And uh, so the, the work is powerful, and uh, it's changed because we have changed. So this is with tissue paper. I uh, selected the colors and um, I, I just wanted to portray a sense of unity and camaraderie, um, a commonality, and, uh, a and show the strength in that we-ism, them being together. They're coming together uh, strongly. So I wanted their stance, how they're standing, they're erect, they're not about, no, no stuff, you know, their vision is strong, and yeah. it's called still standing, um, uh, emphasizing that no matter what, we are not going to, again, give up. Um, and I wanted to make each individual um, something the audience can relate to. Cause I, and, and that's something else that is really important to me. Um, I used to, want to stand beside my painting and tell you what it meant when I had viewers. But uh, I got reminded of how I used to go to exhibits with my father and uh, people would ask, well, Joe, uh, what does this painting mean and blah, blah, blah. Uh, he said, what does it mean to you? What do you see? You know, and when I asked the viewer that, it's more interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, because they take your, your work to another level, a different zone, a different plane, and they reintroduce you to your work. You see things that you didn't even see before because of their interpretation. Talk about those beautiful art pieces that are dangling from your ear. Um, these earrings are made from cloth. Um, I wanted, I, I like big earrings and I like color. And so, as I've gotten older, my earlobes cannot handle the weight of big earrings. So, my solution was to make my own earrings and make them lightweight and use what was available to me. So, I can go in a secondhand store and buy up some t-shirts, get them cleaned and cut them up and then and create um, you know, earrings that are lightweight, uh, unique, uh, one of a kind, um, and you know, still satisfying my desire to be bold and, and express myself. What's the future for Magisa? My future is to keep growing as a person first and as a human being. I never thought at, you know, being in my 60s that I would have be at a crossroads. But I've come to understand that there are only so many years, and you will, in spite of age, will come to a crossroad. And as long as you realize that you are always in class, you won't you won't stop learning. And that keeps me going. That's my future: to keep learning, to keep sharing, to keep giving, to keep inspiring, to keep teaching. Because I think the bottom line, that's what my purpose on earth is, is to teach. So that's my future. Keep being me and being the best I can.